El doctor Amartya Sen es un economista y filósofo indio, premio Nobel de Economía, considerado uno de los más influyentes pensadores contemporáneos en temas de desarrollo. Actualmente es profesor de la Universidad de Harvard y durante muchos años ha enseñado en Oxford, Cambridge, la London School of Economics y las principales universidades de la India. Amartya Sen es el autor de una veintena de libros, entre ellos sobre la desigualdad económica, pobreza y hambruna, ética y economía y desarrollo y libertad. Su último libro se titula Incertidumbre en la Gloria y trata de las contradicciones del crecimiento económico de la India, su país. En 1998, la Academia de Ciencias de Suecia le otorgó el Premio Nobel de Economía por sus aportes a la teoría de la elección social, en la que incorpora bienes como libertad e igualdad en la teoría del desarrollo. Su trabajo en el campo del desarrollo económico ha tenido una influencia determinante en la formulación del Índice de Desarrollo Humano del Programa de Naciones Unidas para el Desarrollo. Precisamente la semana pasada, el profesor Zen estuvo en Managua, en el campus de la UCA, participando en un seminario sobre desarrollo humano sostenible auspiciado por el PNUD. Acérrimo defensor de la libertad de prensa, el profesor Amartya Sen nos brindó una entrevista exclusiva para la Televisión Nacional y esto fue lo que nos dijo. Profesor Sen, usted vino a Managua a atender una conferencia sobre desarrollo humano. ¿En qué se diferencia este concepto de lo que conocemos como crecimiento económico? Well, economic growth traditionally has been seen in terms of the expansion of the overall national income, gross national product, uh, something, some other measure of total income of a nation. Now, human development differs from it in two different ways, two distinct respects. One is that it's really concerned not so much with the products and commodities we have, but the nature of the human life. People have uh, how long they live, how well they are, uh, whether they are bothered by uh, ill health, illiteracy, and that kind of thing. It takes into account income as well, but among m many other factors. And also it's concerned um, with the, um, not just the aggregate for the nation, but it's also seeing how the aggregate plays up in the lives of individuals. Now, it, you cannot capture in one number all that, but human development as an approach is an attempt to go in that direction, and there have been many other supplementary measures since then. ¿Qué tipo de relación existe entre desarrollo humano y el tipo de gobierno o instituciones políticas? Por ejemplo, ¿se requiere tener instituciones democráticas o se puede lograr con un gobierno autoritario? Well, I think uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think it really depends on how broadly you define human development. Because if by human development you include uh, the ability of human beings to lead the kind of life they want to lead without being restrained, either by poverty and forces of circumstances or by epidemics, famines and so on, or by an authoritarian government, then having a democratic uh, society is part of the requirement of human development. But it's not the only requirement. There are other things, and I wouldn't say more important, but different, like how long you live, how feel free from illness you are, uh, how much you have been able to con conquer undernourishment and indeed malnourishment of, of not having the right kind of nutrients, uh, how well you are, how educated you are, what opportunities you have. Now, these latter things uh, can sometimes flourish quite well in a society which is not democratic. I mean, in that respect, for example, uh, China actually has done very well. On the other hand, in the absence of a fully democratic multi-party system, one could say that there is something in the human development that's lacking. Now, the human development index, the kind of thing that came around and been much used since the 1990s, they have tended to concentrate more on economic things like, uh, well, uh, more immediately tangible and more immediately uh, uh, measurable things. Uh, and therefore, they've been focused on life expectancy, focus on uh, illiteracy, uh, literacy and education. And in this perspective, uh, democracy hasn't really figured. Not because it's not important, but because it's difficult to put it into an index in that kind. So I think one has to bear in mind 
that there are many things that can happen, even in the absence of democracy, but ultimately to make them sustainable, you have to have a democratic system. In the absence of a democracy, a country could go to it like South Korea and have very good human development figures, or can go towards North Korea and have pretty foul human development figures. So it is, I think democracy is both important in itself and also in guaranteeing the ability of human beings to choose the kind of society they have reason to want to live in. Usted ha investigado de manera exhaustiva sobre la importancia de la libertad de prensa, la transparencia y el debate público para prevenir hambrunas. ¿Cómo funciona esa relación? Famines are a, very easy to prevent. It's absolutely amazing they take place because it's not like regular hun hunger, of which there is a lot uh, in the world, which is not like famine because people just don't have enough food or the right kind of food. But famines are is such an extreme state of starvation and illnesses connected with starvation, movement of people from one part to another looking for real food, eat, trying to eat anything even from the dustbin and, and garbage cans. And in that kind of situation, uh, people die in very large numbers. Now, the um, India, uh, where I come from, um, uh, continued to have famine. I mean, the British Empire began in 1770 with a gigantic famine, and it ended with a gigantic famine in 1943. It was a regular feature. And it stopped immediately with independence. That was easy to do, because with, uh, uh, with independence and a democratic society, multi-party, no government can actually get away with allowing a famine to develop. And now you come back to the first proposition that famines are easy to prevent, and therefore they were immediately prevented. That simply went away. On the other hand, there are a kind of other problems which are very serious, not perhaps as dramatic or not as catastrophic as famine, like regular undernourishment, of which say, in India there is a lot. And I've recently written a, written a book along with Lord Wales discussing why deprivation is so large in India, including very large amount of undernourishment, um, very bad system of healthcare, and continued illiteracy. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the proportion of literacy had gone up, but not nearly anywhere that, that the country should be proud of. So given all that, the question is, why is it that it works in the case of famine, but not the others? Now, famines are very easy to dramatize. People understand the government responsibility immediately. But when you have some people going around somewhat underfed, therefore more prone to illness, uh, there are schools but they are not really run properly, or there are not enough schools within close distance. That is a much more dramatically difficult thing to, to emphasize. And I think the Indian, I think the, I, I'm very critical of the, of the way the Indian political party and the media has worked, and the book is a lot about that. And we have to do a lot more in order to eliminate undernourishment and illiteracy and ill health in the preventable ill health in the same way that uh, India has dealt with famine. Usted ha dicho de forma categórica que el debate público es la fuente más importante de cambio social. ¿Por qué? Uh, public debate makes people understand uh, a catastrophic problem or a difficult problem or simply a major problem when you could not just thinking about it, get it. You hear from others, you discuss. Uh, you know, humanity has always learned from each other. Also, in deciding on what we should do, what are our priorities, we have to bear in mind that public debate can enrich it a lot. I mean, just to give an example, not famine, again from India, about 10 years ago, suddenly we were told that India was going to become the biggest focus of AIDS epidemic. And all the predictions coming from the UN, etc., put a larger number of AIDS patients in India than anywhere else. Now that became, unlike normal undernourishment, which actually shamefully continued, this became a suddenly a dramatic alert, rather like the famine. And there were a lot of actions taken. And, you know, when actions are demanded by the public, and in a democratic government, when there's a pressure there, 
coming from the opposition, from coming from the media. Then something happened. Now, no one now thinks that India is going to be the center of AIDS epidemic. The problem hasn't gone away, but the, lumber, ma, the numbers are turning out to be minute in comparison with what was predicted. So there are a number of other ways in which public discussion is effective in translating a problem into its recognition and remedia. And secondly, it also allows us to discuss what is it that we should emphasize. Veamos ahora la otra cara de la moneda. ¿Cuáles serían las consecuencias en una sociedad donde hay una tendencia a controlar la prensa, ya sea por el gobierno, por grupos privados y para imponer un monólogo oficial? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Let's take the case of China. Um, because uh, China is a very interesting case, because I believe um, uh, it's not just my politics, but I do believe that the Chinese government, even at the time of Mao Zedong, was trying to do a lot of good for the country. But it failed. It had a gigantic famine at the period of Great Leap Forward, when 30 million people died. Um, now, that is the time when, for three years, the policies were unrevised even though 10 million or so people were dying each year. What happened? The newspapers were completely controlled, so no one criticized the government, and the government itself came to believe its own propaganda. Ultimately, when three years later the change came, one of the more interesting statements is that of Mao Zedong in 1962 to a lecture of 7,000 members of the Communist Party. And he said, it's the only time I've seen him saying it, saying that, in the absence of democracy, we can't plan very well because the government was misled because we were not getting the information from the ground. So this is Mao's rather hesitant tribute to democracy. But then, you know, uh, when they, and then there were the period of cultural revolution in which some good things happened, one shouldn't deny, but there were also quite a lot of bad things. Then came the economic reforms. Very many good things happened. They marketized the industry and agriculture with great success, and they needed to do it. They were too suspicious of the market. But suddenly, compared with the period in the Maoist period, when everyone was covered in health care, the new government decided you have to buy your medical insurance, as in the United States. The result was the percentage of population covered dropped from 100 to about 10 percent. And as a result, and we've discussed it in our book, if you look at it, the life expectancy was dramatically going up suddenly uh, started faltering. Now, now it took about 25 years for the Chinese to catch up and change that. Now, so at the same time, there's no question that as the dialogue in China, despite not having a multi-party system, I mean, I'm, I go to China quite often. I think there's a lot to learn from it. The Chinese government knows that I don't approve of everything in there, but I do admire those things which are there to approve. And, and I, I'm also a, a, a chair, actually, a, a advisory group of the Development Institute of, the, of Peking University. So I've seen the, how the scope of dialogue has increased. As it increased, the Chinese economy has become better rather than worse. So I think it's very important not to suppress information, to allow medium freedom. It's important for people knowing what's going on. It's important for the government understanding what is going on and what people demand. It is very important for people to talk with each other to decide what are the priorities there. Is it a priority to have uh, you know, some kind of mechanical criteria of GDP growth, or is it a priority about the nature of human life and how we can enhance it, and how we can reduce poverty, which has so many different dimensions? How do we think about it? So all these questions is very dependent on open public discussion. Usted ha escrito sobre la necesidad de una alianza entre el Estado y el mercado, entre lo público y lo privado. ¿Bajo qué reglas? I don't think the public and the private sector get into an alliance on their own. I think people have to determine how they would fit in into an overall pattern. You know, when I have a, if I'm ill, and if I uh, get medicine from a doctor, and if I decide on what nutrition to have on the basis of either uh, traditional knowledge or because of advice of a nutritionist. This is not an alliance between nutritionist and doctor. It's an alliance of me with doctors and nutritionists. So similarly for the people, the public sector has a role, the private sector has a role. Private sector, the world experience indicates, including that of China, 
that quite often the private sector can do enormously good uh, in, in terms of industries and particularly agriculture. On the other hand, the private sector in healthcare could be quite disastrous, uh, particularly when it makes it uh, the healthcare unaffordable to the people. So I think it, it's, we, uh, so there is a role, and similarly about education. So there, and also even in industries, there sometimes it is quite important to make sure that the dominance of, of a narrow view of economic advantage or profit seeking doesn't subvert the interests of the, of the public in general. And while doing that, uh, I think we have to balance in an intelligent way between the public and private sector. And that's why some of us emphasize in the, in the, 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 the conference you referred to, for which I've come, have been quite keen on, uh, on generating public discussion. Because it's through public discussion we decide what's the role of the state, what's the role of the market, not the public, uh, what's the role of the private sector, what's of the public sector, what balance we should choose. Central to it is humanity, human reasoning and society in which human beings reason, argue with each other, learn from each other, try to influence each other. I think one shouldn't think of it as public and private getting into, you know, kind of, that looks like a kind of a, a clash between two titans. Uh, we don't want that. What we want is people being in charge, in control. Usted aboga por la necesidad de inversiones públicas masivas en políticas sociales como salud, educación. ¿Es posible lograr esto sin caer en el clientelismo político? Yes, it depends how you do it. You, I think there's nothing as important as accountability in producing these things. And it's a mistake to think that all you have to do is to set up these state enterprises and it will work. They'll never work like that. You have to have a system of accountability. And many countries have failed. And the state versus private debate is very often a kind of failed reflection of accountability versus no accountability debate. But if you have accountability, then a system can work much more and much more efficient, much more um, strongly and much more efficiently. So yes, it is, but you have to say, you have to say that why is it that some, the, what are the scope of corruption? What are the scope, you said, they use the word clientelism. Uh, what, are, what are the different ways in which they manifest itself, themselves and what we can do about it. It can certainly be done, but it would not automatically be done. So I think state versus, you see, there's something quite misleading about the state versus market debate. Because, uh, you know, and for example, in India, there's a lot of people very keen on privatizing everything. And among other things, you read in the newspaper that the Chinese power sector worked better than India because Indian power sector is, is state, Chinese power sector is private. Now, the fact that the Chinese power sector is not private, it's also state. But they have a better accountability system. Not easily, they had big problems initially, but they've developed a better accountability system than India has. So, to say that privatized because that's what the Chinese do is A, an error, B, a mistaken conclusion. But on the other hand, to learn from China how to do accountability and what to make of the profit of the, of the in electricity industry, for example. Uh, you know, in India, they tend to subsidize uh, really basically the more powerful groups of the people. Subsidize electricity uh, in towns, uh, subsidize diesel, uh, all kinds of things. Whereas in China, they have tended to use it mainly to keep the power sector well stocked so that they don't have the kind of power failures that is quite common in India maybe less common than in Pakistan, but it's still very common. So I think it's very important to put the debate where it is, should be, namely accountability. When you read in the media news about a boom economic or progress economic, what do you attention? Well, I look at two things. I look at uh, who is it benefiting and who are, not, uh, who are being left behind. But I also look at what the basis of the boom is. And let me come back to uh, uh, India again. I'm, I'm illustrating it partly because I know more about it, partly because I've just written a book on it. Um, I think the, one of the reasons why the economic boom in India was, which was quite high, India was the second fastest growing large economy in the world, growing at eight, eight and a half percent for some years. But one of the things was that the impact of it on public services, I mean, they were generating public revenue, 
but the impact of it on education and healthcare was far less than what could have happened. In addition to the fact that quite often the poor were not getting much of a share of the boom. But there was a second thing. Since the boom was primarily based on fairly high skilled uh, labor force in, in, in uh, information technology, in pharmaceuticals, uh, in, uh, in, in specialized auto parts and so on. A few fields. So they were benefiting those who were already well educated in school and went had, went had a good technical education, even when half the country don't have any kind of decent schooling at all. So I think the basis of the boom is very important. And it's not so much to say that economic boom is not itself adequate, but that an economic boom that does not encompass the people, that doesn't draw on the people, is basically very fragile. Usted se describe como un feminista. ¿Es optimista sobre el progreso de los derechos de la mujer? Yes, I, I am. Uh, but uh, I, I'm a feminist despite being a man, as you <laughs> recognize it, because I think for two reasons. One is that these, uh, uh, the, the in interests of uh, women have been neglected and, and justice to women have been neglected in a big way. Uh, 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 and uh, that applies to many countries, including to, to, to India. But also, in the context of the feminist literature, a lot of inequalities got discussed, which was easier to understand for people than other kinds of inequality, like class. Uh, for example, men and women tend to live together <laughs> in a family. And therefore, it's much easier to communicate female deprivation. Capitalists and workers don't live together in the same family. As a result, quite a lot of understanding of what's wrong with the inequality of capitalism came via the feminist literature because it was easier to communicate through the family picture. So yes, I'm feminist and am I uh, optimistic? Yes, I wish it moved faster. But uh, is it moving? Yes, it's certainly moving. Algunas personas lo han descrito a usted como la conciencia de la profesión o como la madre Teresa de la economía. ¿Esa es una descripción justa o incorrecta? They are the most idiotic remarks I can think of. Uh, because, uh, first of all, taking the mother Teresa, uh, <laughs> she has a great admiration for her. She sacrificed her life and she had a different way of approaching it. She didn't think that she should live ostentatiously. And she doesn't think that she, uh, I don't live ostentatiously, but I don't dislike comfort uh, in a way that uh, Mother Teresa was ready to sacrifice. No, it diminishes Mother Teresa, it's a silly remark. On the other hand, it's I who stay up late at night trying to make sense of numbers that seem to don't make any sense. Mother Teresa doesn't do that. So why compare two persons who have got nothing to do with each other? And to say that out of consciousness of economics, it was actually was said by a very great economist in a very well-meaning way. But I think that diminishes the subject. Because right from the beginning, we should think of classical economists. Adam Smith, Karl Marx, John Stuart Mill. They were very concerned about how society is doing. So in the process of trying to praise me, and I don't even regard that as praise, I regard that as a kind of bizarre remark, uh, a very denigrated subject which I think is very unfair to the discipline. And it's not just that they get the history of economics wrong, it's also that they get the potential for economics serving as an ally of human progress wrong. Entonces, ¿cómo describe usted su propia contribución como economista? I describe my contribution as trying to work with other economists to make a little more sense of the world by using economic reasoning. And, uh, you know, uh, each of us bring in some understanding, some appreciation, some experience, uh, and we interact. I'm very happy to interact with economists. I don't go around grumbling about economists. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been, I was asked to be president of the American Economic Association, which I agreed to, president of Indian, I agreed to, president of International, I was elected to be president of the Economic Society. Did I regard that these were tensions? No. Uh, because the Econometric Society is Mathematical Economics, and I'm also very interested in that. I don't think the world in which you, you live with a grumble all the time uh, is a very good world for you or for the world. And I, I, I don't have any great grumble. Do I want to influence other economists to think similarly 
to me in those fields in which I'm confident. Yes, I do. Do I argue about them? Yes, I argue about what will happen in India. I have written extensively on why Europe has gone off the rail altogether, why the European Union was a very great idea, but while the, the, the monetary uh, union and the euro coming before a political union was a mistake. I'm not even in, uh, you know, I'm an Indian citizen, live primarily in America, but uh, I, this doesn't prevent me from participating in it. But I'm not bringing conscience into them. I'm bringing reasoning into them, I hope. I don't think I differ from anyone in terms of having more conscience than others have. Eso es lo que dice el Premio Nobel de Economía Amartya Sen. Y ojalá que estas reflexiones sobre la importancia de la transparencia y el debate público para el desarrollo sirvan como incentivo o como punto de partida para que en Nicaragua se establezca una cultura de diálogo y debate abierto, sin descalificaciones, para promover la discusión que tanta falta hace sobre las políticas públicas nacionales. Vamos a una pausa y nos trasladamos al mercado oriental y los problemas de seguridad ciudadana. Bandilleros activos que me han dicho que ellos se arman en el mercado oriental.